Okay, thank you, Kirsty. Uh, the first thing I'll say is, can everybody hear me? Because I'm not very good at standing behind podiums with microphones. I assume that's a yes. Okay, so what has been a, a sort of linking theme in what I've done over the years as a geologist, um, since I've been in Brighton and before then, involves always rocks and water. So I think most people are familiar with the water cycle. This is an image from the United States Geological Survey. Um, and we've got the surface water system. Um, and Kirsty's already mentioned the groundwater system, which is vitally important, particularly if you live in Brighton. Um, about 90% of your tap water comes out of the aquifer, rather from surface water reservoirs. But what I really want to focus on today starts down much deeper than this. And I want to look at what's happening deep down in the Earth system and the way water reacting with rocks generates some of the resources we're going to need in the next 20 years to move away from carbon intensive energy production. So we're going to be way down below the lowest part of this diagram because what water is doing down there is driving some major geological processes. So I'm not a volcanologist. This isn't my photograph of a volcano. But this is Mount Mayon in the Philippines last year, erupting quite violently. And what powers this type of eruption is the water that's held deep down in the earth, that's dissolved in the magma, and which, as it comes out of solution, expands, drives up fluid pressure, and drives fluid volcanism. So this partly is visual aid number one. I could demonstrate the power of um, hydraulic pressure if I gave this bottle of something quite nice, a really good shake and took the wire off and left it in the middle of the stage. And I can see the AV people blanching as I say that. So we'll save that for later. But you all understand the power of fluid pressure. And we can find the record of that deep down in the rocks. So this is the summit of a hill called Kirunavara in northern Sweden. And what we've got here is the remains of a lava flow. But it's been blown apart by fluid pressure. And then the water that's caused that explosion has precipitated minerals in between these blocks of lava, cemented the thing up, and this is next to two billion tons of iron ore. So the deep fluids that are powering these geological processes are responsible for carrying the metals that make the resources we need for development. And that's going to be a theme I'm going to talk about. So the first question is, what is the toolkit we can use to look at these kind of things? And I started worrying about that down in Cornwall during my PhD. Um, and then, as I worked for the Natural History Museum, we moved up to Sweden. So this is Cornwall. Um, this is Batalloc, for anyone who's familiar with it, tin mine. Um, Aidan Turner's just around the corner with his shirt off, if anyone's looking for Paul Dark in that. But all shot through the granites in Cornwall, we've got veins, quartz veins, and they hold the tin and tungsten. So the first thing we can do to look for evidence of what water's done deep down in the rock cycle is look for the evidence in the rocks. Um, I'll just say there's a photograph of my hammer here, and I go away to do these things, and my children always come back and say, why are you taking photographs of your hammer, Daddy? Um, well, this is scale. We're looking at what scale that is. So if we look at the rocks, we can look at what the evidence is for these fluid processes. So this is magnetite breccia already. We said this on the summit of Karunavara. Um, within the iron ore at Karunavara, we can see individual crystals and minerals. This is apatite. Um, we know this formed at about 400 degrees centigrade, but this is the same mineral that your teeth are made out of. And we can look at the chemistry of the minerals involved in these processes to give us indications of what went on. We can look at where the waters fractured the rocks and precipitated minerals. And we can find the actual metals that have been transported. So this is what we were doing in Sweden. We were looking for this. So this is magnetite again. It's iron oxide. It's been blasted apart by fluid pressure and faulting in this case. And it's cemented back together by this lovely golden yellow mineral. That's chalcopyrite. That's copper iron sulfide. So this is the main ore of copper. And we were quite happy when a drilling rig cut through this at the time. Um, there is an aside there. It's continuing on the theme of looking at the rocks. Because if you go to the literature, a lot of people will say 
that those iron ore deposits in northern Sweden formed by crystallization from magma. And they like to shout at me when I say, no, it's all hydrothermal fluids, hot water. Well, these are very similar rocks from Kazakhstan. So this green mineral here is diopside. I won't keep talking about mineral formula. I think mineral formula are fantastic, but most people think not for some reason. Um, but this is diopside. It's a calcium magnesium silicate. It's in magnetite again. It's associated with volcanic breccias again. But deep down in the heart of the Turgai magnetite deposits in Kazakhstan, we get fossils. So the probability is that this probably wasn't a lava flow. What we've done here, you can see there's an ammonoid here, beautiful spiral cut through by the slab we've cut through that um, sample. And this is where the ore minerals, the metals that have been transported by these high temperature solutions have perfectly replaced a limestone. Even to the extent here where in the middle of a rock that's seen about 500 degrees centigrade, we can find corals preserved in magnetite and a mineral called pyroxene. So we've always got to go back and look at the rocks first for evidence. Then we can look at what's actually in the minerals. So these are quartz crystals from parts of Sweden. Um, they're under a microscope. So this is 50 microns, 50 millionths of a meter. And what you can see here are fluid inclusions. These are individual samples of the solutions that form these ore deposits. And in this case, they've got a little vapor bubble, they've got a gas bubble in there, and they've got a perfect cube. So that's halite, that's sodium chloride. So we know from looking at these kind of samples that the solutions that were involved in forming that iron deposit had about 58% salts, 10 times more salty than seawater. And when we heat these up until they form a single liquid again, they formed at over 400 degrees centigrade, deep down in the Earth system. The other thing that can happen, like my bottle of carver, is these kind of things. We've got a fluid inclusion with a vapor bubble, then one liquid, and a second liquid. And we've frozen these. We've measured the melting temperature of those liquids. So this one part of the inclusion is still salty water on the outside, and the darker part here is liquid carbon dioxide. And when we look at a single group of these inclusions, trapped in a quartz crystal again, we can see we've separated out from the salty water the liquid carbon dioxide, the fluids of effervesced, in essence. Though we're not looking at carbon dioxide gas coming out, we're looking at carbon dioxide liquid. So we get a fantastic record of what's gone on in these deposit types. And nowadays, we can get even cleverer. We can crush the quartz and analyze the chemistry of the solutions. So this is the dissolved salt content. This is how much chlorine and bromine they have up at the side in the top graph there. And what's shaded red is the ratio of chlorine to bromine we see in gases coming out of the top of modern volcanoes. The spot down in the bottom corner is modern seawater. So what we can see here is that the solutions that are responsible for making these iron deposits probably came from crystallizing magma. Um, but somewhere along the line, they've picked up extra chlorine. And what we think happened here is that these wonderful saline solutions came off crystallizing granites and then dissolved rock salt preserved in the rock sequence they were intruded into to make these brines that are 10 times or more saltier than seawater. And they can carry a lot of metal. They can certainly carry a lot of iron. But down here, we've done an extra thing. We've gone the extra mile. We've stopped just crushing the quartz now. And we've blown individual inclusions open with a laser up at Leeds University. And in this case now, we can see the really, really salty stuff has less copper in than the solutions with the least salt. We've got, this is a logarithmic scale, so every 10 here is another increment of 10. So we're actually about a thousand times more copper in the least concentrated solutions. And that's because copper's not following salt, it's following sulfur. And that we can get from analyzing individual inclusions. The last part of the toolkit that I want to mention is to really go down in detail. So this is an electron microscope photograph. This is a backscattered electron image. So the shades of gray here are telling us where we've got different chemistries, heavier elements. So you can see, this is a mineral called titanite. It's calcium titanium silicate. And the core of the crystal here has been corroded and dissolved away. And then we've got a new layer of titanite 
on top. So this is just from next to one of these iron deposits. And these very regular shaped holes here are where we've blown it, holes in it with a laser again. We like doing things with lasers. Lasers are great. Um, so the round holes, we've done a chemical analysis. And the long holes are where we've measured the radioactive isotopes in the mineral. And that's giving us information about when this all happened. So they've got here uranium. Uranium radioactively decays to lead. And there are two radioactive uranium isotopes, so two forms of uranium that decay to two different forms of lead, which is great because if we measure the ratios of the different isotopes, we can get a cross-check. So the black line on this diagram here is where everything agrees, and the numbers are millions of years old. So this is 2 billion years old at the top and 1.8 billion years old down here. And we can see the core of those crystals formed about 2 billion years ago, and the rims that match up with the iron mineralization formed about 1.8 million billion years ago. So we've got a real difference in time between processes. And we can match that up with the chemistry of the sample. So we've got both radioactive isotopes giving us age and chemistry giving us extra information. And the chemicals here, the, the elements we've used, are the rare earth elements. So this is a group of elements. If you're used to the periodic table, it's the long thin bit in the middle that they drop down off the bottom. They're very useful as tracers of geological processes. Um, we do have to do one thing. This will come up a lot. If we just plot their concentrations up, they're really spiky. They're really irregular. So we smooth them out. And just to get even bigger picture, we do that by dividing their concentration by what we think is the best estimate of the bulk composition of the Earth. So chondrite is a type of meteorite. And we reference everything back to chondrite meteorites. So we've got the rocks themselves. We've got the fluids that are trapped in them. We've got the chemistry of the minerals. And we've got radiation, radioactive isotopes of different sorts. So that's great. And I love iron mines. I've spent a lot of time around them. But we've been mining iron for millennia, and we recycle an awful lot of it. So the question is, what do we need to mine now? And trying to illustrate this with a wind turbine and an electric car. So this is the periodic table. These are the rare earths down the middle. We can play bingo for a minute now. So this is partly who have I bored in the last five years, and partly how many of my students remember what I'm talking about. But who's carrying some gallium? Oh, no one was listening. Oh, someone was. OK, how about dysprosium? It's the same person was listening every time, which is very, very good. OK, um, arsenic. It's the same person again. Fantastic. You're all carrying all of them. They're all in your mobile phone, interestingly. So the ones I'm particularly interested in, as we said, are the, the lanthanides, the rare earths, this group here, light to heavy. Um, and the reason for that is if we take a normal iron magnet and put some neodymium or dysprosium in it, it gets very, very strong. So this is a set of iron neodymium boron magnets from a place called Bayanobo in China. And dangling off it, we've got a piece of drill core from Kiruna, the iron mine. And somebody said to me earlier on when I tried <laughs> this out, inevitable, have I got a piece of string on that? No, I haven't. I've also now broken my sample. I'll pick that up in a minute. Don't bring visual aids to your inaugural lecture is probably the lesson there. So if you look at a smartphone, as I say, 50 years ago, we mined about 10 metals. Now we mine all of this lot. Um, and we've got the rare earths, dysprosium, neodymium. We've got arsenic in the silicon chips. Um, we've got indium in the screen. We've got yttrium in the screen, all sorts of elements that you might not be that familiar with, <laughs> apart from the person who kept putting their hand up. I think it's Fred Riku in the back there. So. Someone's listened to me recently. But that's not the end of it. The important thing here is, <laughs> Kirsty's making sure I don't trip up over my own samples, is that if you want to put a turbine generator on a wind turbine, 30 meters up in the air, you need to make the magnet at the core of that generator as lightweight for the maximum magnetic field strength that you can. If you want an electric car, you need to reverse that. But still, you need the mightiest, strongest magnet you can get. 
So both of these need rare earth elements. If you want to go to solar, we need selenium and tellurium. So there's a whole selection of elements that we don't currently produce in huge concentrations, which are going into our renewable energy generation. So this has been expressed, so this is from one of our co-workers, Catherine Goodenough, at the British Geological Survey. We've got to shift from producing oil and gas and go back to mining. And we've got to do it in an environmentally sensitive way as possible because we're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. So we don't want to make it worse by mining things. But the quote that sums it all up from the sort of journal Nature in 2017, basically, a transition to a low carbon society is a change that will require vast amounts of metals and minerals. Mineral resourcing and climate change are inextricably linked because the world cannot tackle climate change without an adequate supply of raw materials to go into those technologies. So, we need to look at these things. So this is the rare earths. I haven't looked at everything here, and lithium and cobalt are the next ones people are going to have to worry about. But this is the amount of total rare earth content of the ore, plotted against the amount of rock that's got that content in, and the lines cutting across it are the am contained amount of metal. So we've got all sorts of deposits here, and all the biggest ones you'll know are black circles. They're related to carbonatites. And all the next biggest ones are squares, and they're related to something called alkali granites. So basically, we've got two rock types that are controlling our supply of these min elements. And Bay and Obo here, Kirsty mentioned in the introduction, is the world's largest deposit of these things in Inner Mongolia in China. So we've got to explain what these rock types are to start with. This is old Daniel Lengai in Tanzania. I've never been there. I'd like to go there if anyone's funding grants in the audience. Um, this is the world's only carbonatite volcano. So what you can see here, the top of this volcano, the white material is sodium bicarbonate. It's baking soda. But it's coming out and erupting from a volcanic crater, molten. So in the rock record, we see these. They're calcium carbonate or magnesium carbonate, largely because if it rains heavily, the lava flows will dissolve on Aldonia Lengai. But these are always associated with these rare metals. This is one of my photographs. This is Kambogd in Mongolia. These are the alkali granites. So a granite down in Cornwall will have lots of potassium minerals in it. But Kambogd, all the dark green flecks here, are sodium minerals. And in amongst the sodium minerals, we get this brown material. This is something called um, eudialite, which so is a conosilicate. And this actually has probably got more rare earths in it than the carbonatites. But anything with zirconium in is really hard to dissolve. So these are very, very difficult to dissolve up. But there's a lot of these around, particularly in places like Greenland. Um, somebody recently offered to buy Greenland. There was a reason. So if we look at these, these are these chondrite normalized plots again. And if we look at the carbonatites, they're very rich in the light end. But what we really want, we want neodymium, which is up this end, that's great. But we also want a lot of dysprosium. And there's not so much of that in the carbonatites. But there is a lot of it in the alkali granites. So we've got a problem. We've got things we can process easily, um, which don't have rare earths we use, but not the ones we want quite the proportions we want them. And we have things that are very hard to process that have got more like what we're looking for. So we've got to answer some questions about these. And the first one is, how do we form the world class, the world's largest rare earth deposit? Because this is why there's a geopolitical angle to this. China controls the world's rare earth supply because Bay and Obo sits there in Inner Mongolia um, as the world's largest rare earth resource. And I've spent quite a lot of time worrying about this. So here we see these are eroded down, but these are the feeders that fed a carbonatite volcano um, probably about a billion years ago. We've got limestone dikes that cut across the surrounding rocks. And they surround this ore deposit. And we get these stripy rocks here. So the grey stripes, doesn't look very much like a carbonatite anymore, a magnetite, iron oxide again. The purple stripes are fluorite, calcium fluoride. And the pale stripes are a mixture of apatite and things like basnazite and monazite, which are less familiar, but they're rare earth minerals. So they're all sitting in these rocks. But you can see those layers have been folded. They've been squished up. 
And if down at the base here, we've got a photograph. This is a microscope photograph. It's taken in cathode luminescence. In other words, we've fired electrons at the sample and made it glow. And that's another use of these elements. They go into making your TV screen work. All those nice colours on your phone. Um, but what it allows us to see is that these minerals have been crushed up. They've been deformed. They've been broken up. But then they're cut across by yet more hydrothermal solution veins. And this is the real key. This is the clue at Bay and Oboe. Um, it hasn't happened once. If we look at the radioactive isotope dates at Bay and Oboe, and this is a compilation of all the data that's ever been published, these are bits of the rock that they intruded through. So they're two billion years old, but they're nothing to do with the story we want to investigate. The carbonatite dikes are about 1.2 billion years old. And then there's a second stage on the carbonatite dikes that's about 400 million years old. So this is the st same sort of age as the mountains in Scotland. There's a clue there. If we look at the ore deposits in red here, they've got radio radioactive isotope ages about the same as the carbonatites. But then they've got lots and lots of little clusters of ages that are younger. And then if we look at the veins that could across the, the ores, they're all this age. And what's that telling us is that we formed a metal concentration about a billion years ago, and then we've kept upgrading it. We've metamorphosed it, we've had more solutions, and we keep adding more and more metal over time. So that's how you form the biggest one. If you want to find another one, you've got to find somewhere else where lightning struck twice, three times, four times. But we can see this. This is from my colleague, Linda Campbell. And she's actually dated this crystal with a laser. And the core here is a billion years old. And the rim is 400 million years old. So we've reactivated the deposit. Um, but the problem with Bay and Oboe is it's richest in the light rare earths. It's richest in the ones we don't have quite the demand for. So because we know how to process carbonatite deposits, it might be good if we could find one that had more of the heavy rare earths in. Um, and that's down this end. And this is it's very bad, but I date, take great delight in this. I've spent my career waiting to work in this place. Um, these are from a carbonatite deposit called Huang Long Pu. Um, which is in the Kinling Mountains in central China. So we've come south. This is the Kinling Mountain Belt. And here we can go and look for a heavy rare earth enriched carbonatite. So again, we've got this swarm of dikes that cut through ancient rocks. And we get calcite. We get calcium carbonate. We've got quartz in the center of these dikes. There's the hammer here for scale again. And we've got shattered rock because of the fluid pressure, the hydrothermal processes. Um, and we see beautiful minerals in there. So this is chalcopyrite and molybdenite, so two sulfide minerals, bounding hydrothermal quartz, hot water solutions again, in the center of the vein there. And in this part of the carbonatite, we find rare earth minerals. And what we can see, we're back to electron microscope photographs, but this is monazite, rare earth phosphate, and it's reacted to make apatite. So it's lost its rare earths as the hot solutions, the hydrothermal fluids, have entered into this thing. But then we get other minerals coming in. So these things, fluorocarbonates, and these progressively get more of the heavy rare earths. So if we look at these, early on in the history of the carbonatites, when it's still a magma, we get light rare earth elements. But as we move, recorded by these mineral reactions, we move through the history of the carbonatites, we get progressively more and more of the heavy rare earths coming in, the dysprosium that's going into our high strength magnets. So that is of interest. And we want to know why. Can we find this somewhere else as well? Well, Delia Kangalosi is a PhD student I'm working with at the moment at the University of Leeds. And she's gone into those quartz veins and looked for the fluid inclusions. And you can see here again, we get lots and lots of salt dissolved in the water that's reacted with these carbonatite dikes. We also get carbon dioxide. The inclusion in the middle here has got that dark rim of liquid carbon dioxide again. But the salts are different. Delia's gone in with a laser, measured part of the spectroscopy of these minerals, and we're finding not chlorides, 
normal salt, but sulfates. So this is anhydrite, calcium sulfate. We've also got potassium sulfate, um, strontium sulfate. I'm giving the chemical name so I don't have to try and pronounce. Yeah, that one, because I can't. <laughs> it's not a common mineral, but we've got a mix potassium sodium sulfate. So sulfate brines have carried more of the heavy rare earths that we're interested in compared to chloride blind, brines that we see at places like Bayonobo. So if we want to look for a really big deposit, let's go and look for somewhere where it kept happening, the same process over nearly a billion years, kept happening in the same place and making a bigger and bigger deposit. We can also see deposits where the sequence of minerals has given us progressively more of the type of element we want. And that might relate to sulfur-rich brines, sulfur-rich solutions instead of chloride-rich solutions. But I'll step back a second here, because one of the issues uh, is down at this end of the diagram, I've plotted thorium and uranium. So in searching for the elements we want for renewable energy, we'd probably rather not leave behind a waste product that's radioactive. It's not really the point of what we're about. So the next stage really is, okay, that's where our rare earths are coming from now. Can we find something that doesn't have radioactive elements in it? Um, where do we want to go for low actinide, radioactive element, easy to process, heavy rare earth rich rare earth deposits? Well, we went to Madagascar, which was nice. Um, but if you look here, China's the main producer of these things. And down in China, there are tropical soils that are enriched in their rare earth elements. They occur in Australia as well. Mount Weld is in Australia. They occur in places like Vietnam, Dong Pao's in Vietnam. But only in China do we get the really heavy rare earth rich versions, which we'd like for our resource supply. So what we have in Madagascar is a series of ancient volcanoes. They've been eroded down and they've got these alkaline granite igneous rocks in them. But the key point is they're in the tropics. So they've got really intense soil forming processes. So those minerals that are really, really hard to industrial pro in process industrially might cause us their own environmental problems have already been partly broken down by weathering. Uh, it's an exciting place to get around in. Um, this is one of the bridges. But we get these very thick soil profiles. Um, on the right hand side there, you can see quite clearly, these are the dikes, this is the plumbing below the ancient volcano, but all the minerals are partly broken down by the tropical soil weathering processes. So we've looked at profiles like this to try and see what's happening with the rare earths again. We've also worked with mining companies in the area who are drilling through this material <coughs> to see if they can actually find workable resources. And down below the soil profiles, we find the same sorts of things I was looking at in Mongolia. So this is an alkali pegmatite again with the same sorts of minerals in again. So if we look at this, so up in the soil zone here, this is where the plants are rooting, what we'd think of as soil. And here we've lost the rare earth elements. They've been leached out of the soil zone. In the degraded, broken down rock below that, we get a maximum concentration of the rare earths. So the things that have been leached up here have been deposited <laughs> deeper in the soil zone. And there are more of the metals we're interested in here in the weathered rock than there are down in the bedrock. And they're not in insoluble minerals anymore. Because we got this data by just pouring ammonium sulfate solution onto our samples. It's a bit more technical than that, but that's basically what we did. So these can be processed and extracted at really low environmental cost. That's good. And there's no uranium, well, there's a little bit of uranium and thorium, but not so much as to cause a problem. So the question we had to ask then is, all right, where exactly are the rare earths in these systems? So this is Diamond. It's the UK synchrotron X-ray facility. Um, it's basically a small particle accelerator. And what it does is generate a very, very focused, very, very high intensity, high energy X-ray beam that comes out in these little units here where we're standing about to put some rocks into that X-ray beam, which I was quite excited about, thinking I was smiling. Okay, but what we can do with that X-ray beam, we can focus it down onto a millionth of a meter and we can map where individual elements sit in a sample. So this is an electron microscope photograph of one of these um, soil samples. 
We've broken down the minerals to make china clay, which is what most of the background grey is in there. There's some iron oxides and there's some manganese oxides. But when we map the distribution of yttrium, one of the rare earths across that sample, the red here is yttrium, and it's sitting on the edges of the kaolinite crystals. So the rare earths are now sticking to the surface of the clay. We're getting rare metals out of cl china clay deposits, basically. Um, this is the complicated. I'm told not to go too technical, but what we've got here is the X-ray absorption spectrum of each of these, of a whole range of different mineral types. And in green at the top are our Chinese clays. And they don't look like any of these possible rare earth minerals, but they do look like, if we put a solution in there, the um, X-ray absorption pattern of yttrium in solution. And what we find is that if we process this data to extract the distance between the atoms, this is why we go to these phenomenally high-powered X-rays, we can actually see that the clays in Madagascar and in China have got exactly the same molecular structure as just the metals in solution. So we know now that actually, just surrounded by water molecules, very loosely bound to the surface of the clays, we've got a rare metal deposit. You could recover that with detergent. That's fantastic in terms of producing these things. And we've got as far as actually producing a molecular model. I say we, because this has been done by a postdoc, a nuke burst, but we've got a rare earth element atom surrounded by water molecules here, and it's attracted just by electrostatic forces to the surface of the clay mineral particle. So this is a molecular model that we've built from the X-ray data. These things are only used at the moment in China, but they're occurring elsewhere. We've proved that. They're on alkaline igneous rocks where we might get more of the elements we're interested in, although the concentrations aren't necessarily higher. And we've demonstrated for the first time what form the rare earths are there at. They're sat surrounded by water molecules, absorbed onto china clay, kaolinite. All you have to do is disrupt that water layer and you can recover the metals. So that's fantastic. But that's been the focus of a lot of what I've done in the last few years. But we've gone to an additional problem now. There's an extra factor in looking at the soil zone, which is we've got plants rooted into it, and they're part of what are breaking down the minerals. So when we're talking about deep, hot hydrothermal solutions interacting with rocks, we're not worried too much about life. But when we bring it back to the surface, we've got my, um, plants, microbes, a whole range of things going on. And the latest thing we've been working on is to look at what's happening to metals in the environment. And that's been down a really exotic field location now, um, Shoreham Harbour, just outside Brighton. So I've brought us back home for the last little bit I want to talk about. So this is Shoreham Harbour. We've had a lot of support from Shoreham Port. So I can't find Tony. He's waving at the back. So um, the engineering team at Shoreham Port have been phenomenally supportive with this, as have ArcelorMittal, steel company. And we've been concerned what happens to the iron once it's out in the environment. And the reason for that is we get this effect. So this orange streak, this is a steel pile going into the tidal part of Shoreham Harbour, into the bed sediment. And this orange streak is what's known as accelerated low water corrosion. So we've got something here that is eating steel about five times faster than normal pre predicted marine corrosion rates. And we'd like to know what's going on for fairly obvious reasons. This is affecting the distribution of metals in the environment. It's affecting marine structures. And through this process of renewable energy generation, we're actually just about to start putting, or already have put, if you look out the windows at Brighton, a lot more infrastructure into the marine environment. So we want to know what's happening. So we've been down to Shoreham Harbour. Um, Heidi Burgess, my wife, isn't in this photograph, but she's taking the photograph. Um, Richard Brennan's PhD student, um, John Kaplan was the microbiologist on this team, and I'm somewhere down here taking a water sample. And what we've done is looked at the water, the bed sediment, and the corrosion itself. So these are electron microscope photographs of the corrosion in um, Shoreham Harbour. They are in secondary electrons this time, so we're not looking at the chemistry anymore. We're just looking at the topography of the surface. So when you see electron microscope photographs of flies' eyes, this is the kind of thing. But now we're looking at steel corrosion. And we get iron sulfide minerals, we get iron sulfate minerals, and we get iron oxide minerals. But on top of them, we get individual bacteria. So 
what we've got here is bacteria interacting with the minerals and the steel and causing this major corrosion problem. So we've tried to look at what's in there in a number of ways. These are infrared absorption spectra. Um, spectra. So we've put these in infrared light and used an instrument to measure the wavelengths of infrared light that are absorbed. And we see sulfate. We see pyrite, iron sulfide. But we see things like thiosulfate that are between sulfide and sulfate. They're different levels of oxidation. And that's all sitting within this accelerated low water corrosion on the steel surface. We've even gone to things like X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, and we see the same thing. We can find the pyrite. We can find iron sulfate, so not just iron oxide in the rust, but we find these intermediate sulfur compounds, um, sulfite in that case. So this is really important. There's more than just iron making iron oxides here. And it's down to these guys. So a normal photograph of bacteria, I'm not a biologist, so apologies to the biologists, they're not terribly exciting to look at. So we, we've jazzed them up a bit. But what we've got here, we've looked at the DNA that's contained in that corrosion. So what we've got is the microbial genes. If we have bacteria in an environment that's starved of oxygen, they start using other things to process their food. And they use sulfate from the seawater and produce hydrogen sulfide. That's that lovely smell that comes out of the mud. And then we've got bacteria that oxidize the sulfur. So we can identify things that reduce sulfur, um, sulfate. We've got things that oxidize sulfur. We've got things that oxidize sulfide. So we've got all these microbial metabolisms operating in a few millimetres of rust, basically. But what happens alongside this, at every single stage of that, they generate sulfate and hydrogen ions. So if we add sulfate and hydrogen ions together, we get sulfuric acid. And this is a little sulfuric acid generating factory living on the surface of the steel. This is a horrible diagram for a talk like this where I've got lots of different backgrounds, but basically... We start with sulfate in the seawater, and bacteria, things like Desulfobulus propinicus, um, and I'm not going to read any more of these out because I read it wrong, but basically these are processing the seawater sulfate and making hydrogen sulfide. But then things like Chlorobactin tepidum are processing the sulfide back to sulfate, and we've got things up here that are doing the same sort of process. So sitting on the steel surface, we're generating sulfides and then the ba by bacteria, and the, a different group of bacteria then oxidizing the sulfides back to sulfate, and then making sulfuric acid all the way, which is generating iron sulfates on the steel surface and rapidly corroding the steel. When we break these um, bacterial colonies off the steel, we get shiny etched steel underneath. They're sulfuric acid etched. Normal rusting doesn't do that. So we can actually, and we've actually gone as far as looking at where these bacteria come from. And we can actually find them in the harbour bed sediment. Um, there are small colonies of them in the seawater. They don't like the seawater. There's too much oxygen around for them. And so they're colonising the existing rust on the steel surface where they've got a low oxygen environment and then using the sulphate from the seawater. So this whole process is based on, basically, we've put steel piling into reducing bed sediment. So we can identify a risk factor. And this is where we're going next with this, hopefully. We're waiting on a grant proposal at the moment to try and take this a little further and find out more about what's going on in wider places. But there isn't anything unusual about bacteria colonizing steel. It's just that we've introduced something new into the environment for them to live on. So conclusions from all of this. I've taken you from magmas to bacteria. Um, water is a geological material in and of itself. It's driving geological and geochemical processes. It's critical as a resource itself, and I haven't talked about hydrogeology and the geology of water resources at all, but it's also critical in the formation of the resources we require as we move to trying to get, go to renewable power generation. And it's driving the redistribution of metals in the near surface and the interaction of metals with life. And for the last 15 years, these have been growing areas that we've just started to look at at Brighton. But biogeochemistry and geomicrobiology, what the bugs do to the rocks. And that's where I'll leave you. 
I will say at the end, there's too many people to thank because this isn't me. This is a large group of a large number of different teams from um, Czech Republic, Brighton, London, China, Mongolia, um, Madagascar. I've highlighted Heidi because there are people out there I wouldn't be able to do any of this without. Um, and we've had a wide range of funders supporting us to do this. And I'll end there. Thank you very much.